All right. If y'all ready to get started tonight, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for everything He's doing. Um, we are going to go back to, uh, we're in Acts chapter 2. And we're all going to discuss a little bit more about the Holy Spirit uh, to this evening. And, and I want to make sure all of us is, uh, we, we'll review a little bit here about what we learned last week. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to make sure everybody has a, a clear understanding when we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God. Um, this is a first right here in, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, for, uh, for, for the church, this is a first. Uh, for the coming of the Holy Spirit, in this sense, it's a first. Um, we talked about last week uh, a promise. We talked about a promise. A promise was made and a promise was kept. And y'all heard, we heard a lot of that over in 20, 20, 2020. Ain't that one of my favorite uh, Trump slogans? Promise made, promise kept. You know, doing those type deals. But, this is one thing we can say about a God. When God makes a promise, He keeps it to the T. There's no fudging on it. It's a, he'll do exactly what He promised. And, and last week we shared with you uh, in Acts, that in Acts chapter 1, verses 4, um, we looked at that, verses 5, uh, verses 8, uh, that uh, uh, you was promised, God made a promise that you would receive the Holy Spirit of God, you would be baptized uh, in the in the spirit and in Acts chapter two verses one through four we looked at last week that was God kept His promise so that's God making a promise in the previous chapter and in and, and, and other references to that in the Bible and in Acts chapter two is where God kept His promise uh, and we said last week. We couldn't say enough about this. this. The promise had nothing to do uh, with anything that the disciples was doing at this time. We know they was gathered in an upper room. They was praying. And, and the Holy Spirit coming, uh, the Holy Spirit descending, the Holy Spirit baptizing, uh, had nothing, it was not dependent upon anything that they was doing. Anything they was praying, anything that was meaning or some kind of any kind of spiritual condition that had to be met before the promise would come. No, God promised it and God kept the promise. It was all God on God's part. It was nothing to do with us. Uh, we said in chapter 2 and verse 1 that the day of Pentecost had come and all of them was in one accord, in, 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 in one mind. We know that one accord, we always think one mind. They was in unity. And, and the Bible always refers to oneness, uh, of course, one spirit, one body. And we went over all those things last week. And we said Pentecost means 50. Uh, we discussed last week that Pentecost means 50. Uh, so it was the 50th day after Passover. It was the 50th day after Passover. And uh, this is when the Jews celebrated Pentecost. This is when the Jewish people celebrated Pentecost. Uh, in this celebration, they often call it, and I give you many names last week, I don't remember all of them, but one of them was the first fruits of the harvest. And, and that's significant uh, because one of the things that came first in, in that culture was, was that it was usually a wheat harvest. And they was celebrating the first fruits of the harvest on the day of Pentecost. And this is the day that the church was born on the day. And the Holy Spirit had to come on this day. And He came on this day and, and things changed because in the sense that the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit permanently dwelled in God's people, in the believer. And this was very, uh, this is very different uh, than what we had seen from times past. Verse 2 talked about, we mentioned last week, a sound from heaven. And, 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 and we know this came from God. Uh, this sound from heaven came from God like a rushing mighty wind. We said it was wind. But there was no movement. Uh, this is more like a, a blast. This was a loud noise. Uh, and the presence of God just come rushing in. And it said in verse 2, it said, And it filled all the house where they were sitting at. Could you imagine being there? 
and, and, and you hear this, this loud blast. Uh, and, and, and we talked about last week and, and sort of trying to liken it into, uh, I've never been in a tornado. I've heard people describe tornadoes and what it sounds like. I've never been in a, a real bad hurricane. Uh, I've been in some high winds and it sounds pretty loud. You don't, you know, I don't know, y'all have uh, maybe around in this area, we've had a few hurricanes and some high winds. But it was literally, there was no movement of wind, but there was a, a literally a loud blast, a loud rushing sound. And this was the presence of God come and filled this room. And in verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like, unto, uh, like, like, and notice that, like as of fire and it set upon each of them. It was like fire, but it wasn't fire. Just like we said, it was. It sounded. It sounded like wind, but it wasn't actually movement of wind. So it's true here, and and we see that this fire. It says in the scripture here that it's set upon in verse three. It's set upon each of them. See, we had these like these flickering. Uh, and and listen, many theologians describe this even. As likened unto a human tongue, but it was it was it was flickering like fi fire. I guess in the movement we we probably we is probably more descriptive of what was going on, and uh, but this also represented uh, that was more important what this represented uh, in the life of the church in the life of the believer that these, these, these individual little small tongues settled over each one of them and then disappeared. And, and in this, that represented the, the presence of God coming and, and settling down and then dwelling and indwelling the believer. And, and this was significant. This was the sign that, that everybody needed to see. This was a first. We have to remember that a lot of these things we're seeing now, and even as we talk in the next few chapters, several chapters, that these are some of the first things in church history to happen. But as we're going to see tonight with tongues, uh, we said last week as we moved on down to the verses that tongues represented a language. And we talked about how Oh, them tongues has been abused and misused in, in the church uh, across America. Because uh, we're going to read in some scripture tonight where, the, where that part, there's some things that vanished away. Right. You take prophecy, for instance. Uh, there was prophecy in the Old Testament. Now there's prophecy in, in the New Testament in Revelations. But there'll be a time when there's no prophecy. No prophecy is needed. You know, so there's a time for things even in the Bible and, and those things pass away. Just like there's no more apostles. We went through that. Why don't we have any more apostles? And, and it's confusing because y'all see people out here today calling themselves apostles. Right. They're on TV calling themselves apostles. Right. But there's no way they can biblically qualify to be an apostle. That is in church history. That's not needed today. We have, we have the Word of God. God's already spoke, and we have it. So we're going to see this even... Uh, boy, I wish everything... I listen to some great theologians, guys, and I, I, I read after some great theologians. I do my best to try to study and rightly divide the Word of Truth. But this is what I have discovered, that even the most gifted and the most brilliant minds of this world struggle sometimes to explain the things of God. I mean, God's just too vast, guys. I mean, He's God. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it ain't as clear cut as you hear some, I've heard people get up there and preachers get up there and say, boy, they'll, they'll, they'll say something and they'll say, it's this way. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh no, I've studied that. <laughs> There's a little more to it than what you're saying. See, I, I, I'm, I'm very weary to get up here in the pulpit and to draw that kind of line sometimes on certain things. Because I know I've studied after great men that's a whole lot more intelligent than I am, that has a little, whole lot more education, and even the best of them at times struggle to rightly say, 
this is the mind of God. And a lot, some of them, even some of the best, I've heard them say, we just don't know. And see, I, I respect that. When, and when a great man of God gets up there, and I know he is, I've listened to him preach hundreds and hundreds of sermons, literally hundreds of sermons. I've listened to his teaching time and time again, and I've sit under it, and I've followed it, and then he stand up there and say, guys, I, did, I, I just can't sit, really say for sure. Only God knows. See, I respect that. Because I know, I know God. I know the God we serve. Look around, guys. <laughs> John, they struggle to tell you what's even wrong with your body. Well, your, our, our God created the body. How magnificent is that? <laughs> and we're going to stand down here as humans, and, and we're going to, and sometimes in the cruelest sense, dictate this is what God says. You know, sometimes, I know I'm getting awful in there, but it's, it's pretty deep, guys. That's what I'm saying. It's pretty deep. So we got these, these tongues here, and they did represent the presence of God coming upon his people and settling down on his people. And verse 4, and they were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. And we said here that that tongues is translated as languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit led them. But they were filled. And last week, we said last week, uh, with not, as a, not as a glass would be filled, that would be a static filling of a glass. The Holy Spirit is more like, and I've heard multiple, multiple Commentaries describe this, and it's, it's probably a great, the best illustration of that of a boat sail and the wind filling that boat sail. And when the wind fills the boat sail, it controls the boat. It literally drives the boat forward. Y'all have all seen it. Y'all have all seen sailboats. It's nothing. This is a picture everybody can understand. So when the Holy Spirit fills a person is actually the driving force that moves us forward in ministry. It's what uh, enables us to witness. It's what enables us to study the Word of God and have understanding. Uh, the Holy Spirit is what fills us to be able to understand and to move forward. So that's more the picture here that uh, they were all filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this, we'll stop right here and I'm going to say again, uh, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, in, in this event we see taking place right here. And when we think about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, it takes place in the believer's life at the point of salvation. And if I, under, I want to make sure I made that clear last week and hope I... So we'll go back and reiterate it again. Said, the Holy Spirit came here, and they was baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit. For the believer, that takes place at the point of salvation. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. It's the same promise that uh, uh, was given uh, just a chapter back. He said, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That's not just referring to the disciples. That's for every believer at the point of salvation you're baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. So, and, and to help us understand that, I don't know if we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, if you want to look there. Yeah, we did last week. We went there last week. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. You see the wording? Uh, that was 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into this one body. That was that one body. That's the body of Christ. We're all baptized into the same body. That's why I refer to us as the family of God, because we're all one family. We're all one body. You know, so that's the thinking behind that. But that all that takes place through salvation, through being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what identifies us as a believer? Uh, it's the Holy Spirit 
That's what says you are a child of God. And we went over in Romans last week and talked about the Apostle Paul showed that, showed us that. If you have not the Spirit of God, you're none of His. You know, so that identifies you as being part of that body, uh, as being part of the believer, being baptized. In Acts 1 5, that's what we talked about here in that previous verse. That's what. So John submerged uh, them in the water. He submerged them. He baptized them. So the same is true for us that you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days after. So all of this is referring to the baptism. And all of this comes full circle in verse 4, Acts chapter 4. Uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Being baptized. This is when the Holy Spirit baptized. So this is the challenge though for us is our daily walk. And so we're baptized. We have the Holy Spirit of God. But there's one thing that God didn't do. He didn't take away the free will of man. He didn't take, or, or, or ladies, he didn't take away your free will. There's the other part we have to deal with. This wretched body of flesh. <laughs> this wretched body of flesh. So that's why the Bible, make, it, we, we see in different places where there's a call on us to crucify the flesh. And, and, a daily, a fresh and a new. And, and for us, when we, when we talk about we have the Holy Spirit of God, uh, but you know, we can do this and we use this kind of terminology on a daily basis. I can choose to yield to the leading of the Holy Ghost, yield to the leading of the Spirit, or I can choose to yield to the leading of the flesh. There's a decision. Don't, do you all not make that decision every day? You, you, you choose to, God, I'm going to follow after you. I'm going to yield. I'm going to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We said, how did you do that last week? How do we yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit? We said a good place to start was Colossians 3.16 last week. And we said this, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let the words of Christ dwell in you. And I said this last week, when we're yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, on a daily basis, we're yielding our lives to the Word of God. We're yielding our lives to the teachings of the Bible. That's why it's so important when I say, Oh, guys, take this home with you. Take this devotion home with you. I want you to read the Scriptures. Not just when I preach on Sunday. I, I know if you read the Scriptures and, and you open this up on the, I don't know, on a certain day, you, you'll read something and God, He'll give you some instruction out there and you have a decision. Well, I'm going to yield to the teachings of this Scripture or I'm going to go do what I want to do today. Basically, that's what we do, right? We, we either yield to the, to the teachings of Scripture, and when we yield to the words of Christ, when we yield to the Word of God, in essence, we are yielding to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. And when we choose to follow after Scriptures and, and obey, obey Scriptures, and, and, and forsake the flesh and say, man, I don't crucify that flesh today, God. I, I need you to help me crucify that flesh today, a fresh and a new on, on that flesh, God. Help me to follow after the Spirit of God today. That's my prayer a lot of days, guys. I mean, and some days I might forget to pray, pray that, but many days that's my, my prayer. Uh, God, help me to be a fresh and a new and yield myself to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Is that wrong with praying that every day? I, I need that kind of help from God. I need a fresh and a new reminder that the flesh is here trying to lead me astray too. And I know, so we have the Holy Spirit of God, but I think the challenge is in our daily walk. Uh, we can choose to obey the words of Christ uh, and, and yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, and follow the teachings of the Bible or... We can choose to follow the teachings and uh, leadings of Satan and the flesh. I mean, basically, that's what we do. Um, listen. Under the control of the Holy Spirit. Just think about that. Under the control of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happens when you're under the control of the Holy Spirit of God and you're yielding to the Holy Spirit of God is that what is evident or what is on display or what... As we study Galatians, what is manifested in our lives 
is the fruits of the Spirit. So there's evidence when a believer is under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. And you can look, uh, Galatians 5.22 tells you the fruits of the Spirit. That's evident in a person's life that is following after the Spirit of God. So when we're yielding ourselves to the Spirit of God, there's going to be fruits that are evident. And let me just turn it. I'll, I'll read to you again if you want to, but it's good scripture. Verse 16, then, then I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you now shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That was good teaching when we studied Galatians. Did you miss it? He, verse 16, 5, 16 says, then I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we're looking for a solution to it, we walk in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, and it goes on in verse 17, gives a great explanation of the war that takes place. The Spirit's contrary to the flesh, and the flesh is contrary to the Spirit. And, and so that it says that they cannot do, there's a battle taking place within you. You feel that battle within you most days? Yeah. yeah. It's like, man, I just want to wring your neck. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to reach out and grab him. I really do. And say, no, don't. <laughs> that's the flesh. <laughs> no, no, y'all don't think that stuff, do they? Is it just yeah. a preacher? I'm the only one that does. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, 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 it's there. there's a still a battle. We're not. We, and I told you when we studied Galatians, this will be over when the Lord Jesus returns. We will have a body. A glorified body that's perfect and sinless in every way. It'll be like the pre-incarnated body of the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection. We'll have a body such as that. But we'll be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. And Thessalonians, Thessalonians tell us that there's no corruption can enter into heaven, guys. So you're not taking that junk to heaven. <laughs> You will be changed. <laughs> You're not taking that sin into heaven with you. That flesh ain't going. <laughs> I don't know if you know that or not, but when we're talking about being changed, you're changed. You know, so that's what we're talking about here. And, and we're talking about the fruits being on display. This is what a, 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 a spirit-filled Christian will look like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. This is what the person looks like that is being led by the Spirit, is obeying the Word of God, and walking in obedience to the Word of God, and being led by the flesh. The fruits of the Spirit. And we shared with you, I remember I shared with you this example. The fruits of the Spirit is like a beautiful uh, bouquet of flowers and you see all this love joy peace long suffering all of that is yours I didn't say you well you got uh, here's love but you ain't gonna get long suffering <laughs> no it's all it's all yours you just yield to the leading of the Spirit of God you yield to the teachings of the Bible and he said that in verse 24 and they that are Christ apostrophe s I'm not the best in the English but what does that mean when you put apostrophe S on something, what does that mean? Is that, does that show ownership or something? Is it, it, possession? Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I the only one? Did y'all not go to English either? I mean, what's up? I mean, I did have to go to summer school for English. I mean, you know, really? <laughs> I guess I wasn't alone, was I? <laughs> what's apostrophe S look? Y'all looking at me like a deer in the headlight look like, what was he asking up there? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Joy. I appreciate that answer there. It does. It shows possession. It says, and those that are Christ, you belong to Christ? That's you. Have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. 
You have crucified the faith. And, and that's like continuing to crucify the flesh. We have to do it every day. I mean, literally, we have to get up and because that old flesh wants to rear its ugly head in my house. And we have to crucify the flesh. And when we do, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Yeah, it, it's just a wonderful scripture there. And, and that's what it means when a person is filled with the Holy Ghost. You're filled, you are baptized. You have received the Holy Ghost. But after that, there is a walk uh, and, and there is decisions that the believer makes uh, to be, but boy, be filled on a daily basis. It's, it's even in the New Testament, it, it's a continuing thing. You'll find it in the multiple scripture where it's a continuing thing to continue to be filled with the Holy Ghost, continuing to be yielding to the Spirit of God, continuing to obey the scriptures. You know, because I know this is what happens to me when I do contrary to that and I'm uh, yielding to the sin in my life and following after sin in my life. Man, I don't feel very filled. And it ain't about feelings. Maybe that's the wrong. I don't feel like I'm walking in obedience to God and, and I know God's displeased with me. And you know how, you know how, I don't know, one of your kids, not all of them, but you know, I, I, I think I have one that has felt um, himself when he disappointed me. I didn't say anything. But I could tell by his countenance, and it failed. He, he had disappointed his parents. And I'd say nothing, he didn't either. I think that's sort of descriptive of us and God. It doesn't change our status. We're still saved. We're still his children. But it bothers me now when I disappoint my father. It didn't used to bother me, Miss Joy, when I disappointed my father in heaven. Because he wasn't my father. <laughs> Satan was my daddy. But now, when I disappoint my father, it bothers me. I may not say nothing, but I, I walk with my head down, and that's when I'm walking in disobedience to God. I'm not being very filled, Brother John. Uh, and it does not change my status in any way. I'm still his child. It's sort of like with my child, and, and then he comes to me and he says, and this happens, this happens often sometimes, Dad, I'm sorry. I know you, I disappointed you. And what do I do? It's okay, son. I forgive you and I love you. See, what a, what a glorious picture. God has showed me so many times through my kids what my relationship with him looks like, what it really looks like, Brother John. That's real Christianity. That's what, that's what it, it really means to be filled or be obedient or to be following after or obeying Scripture. And, and it, it's all about my relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ and with my Father in heaven. And uh, it, it's not based on feelings. But on the same hand, we, God's Spirit, we don't necessarily, people say we feel God, but we don't really feel God. God give us emotions, and we do feel. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. But I know in my heart when things are right, I think it's probably more descriptive of when, you know, when we know everything's right, what are, we're happy anyway. We're emotional people, we're, we're, pray, we're, we're joyful, and we're more joyful. You know, God give us all that stuff. All that stuff comes from God. He gave us every emotion we had. But my sin, praise God, in one thing, it doesn't change my status. We'll just say that. So, this language here, the first time, uh, this language here that was spoken, at, we, we'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, let's say this, every believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit. On the day of salvation, Ephesians 5.18, and be not drunk with wine. And you've heard this the last few Sundays, but we're in, in excess. It's funny how God's bringing all this stuff around right when we're teaching it. You know, I'm preaching it on Sunday too. He said, be not drunk in, in, with wine, but be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. And that's what I've been preaching on. I was number one as we was preaching about the family. And that means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Total control. Dominated by Scripture. Walking in obedience. Verse 4. And I said tongues is actually a synonym for uh, language. And what we have here is uh, the Jews at Pentecost uh, speaking in verse 4. It said they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is where we sort of stopped last week. And we talked about this for a few minutes. Uh, but I feel like we need to go back through all that and make sure everybody's grounded in this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure you got that. I don't want you to leave here confused about that. And uh, so the Jews was gathered for Pentecost. Okay. And what we have in verse 4, uh, they, be, they began to speak with other tongues, with other languages. And, and, and this is the first time that it's recorded that this is taking place in the Word of God. Uh, for the first time, there was hearers. We think about the people that's mentioned in the following verses, even over to verse 13, uh, especially around uh, verse 9, 10, 11. Uh, these was people that uh, was from all walks of life. Um, primarily those, those people was Gentiles. So what we have here at uh, Pentecost, we have here uh, this language that was spoken, that was spoken. The hearers that was hearing this, 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 this language was, was hearing about the glorious things of God in their own language. And, and it tells us here, as we read, if we read on down, and there were dwelling uh, Jerusalem Jews, devout men. These was devout Jews. These was the utmost uh, respected and followers of the word of God. Out of every nation under heaven was gathered in this place during Pentecost. And, and now, when it was noised, the noise was from verse 2, that rushing mighty wind. They even say that this was heard not just in the upper room. This was noise. This noise, this blast was heard around and people began to gather around in this area. They began to come together. That's what it's saying in verse 6. And were confounded because the ever man heard them speak in his own language. So we have in verse 2, they begin, for, verse 4, I'm sorry, they begin to speak in other tongues. And, and what was this other tongues? This was not a new language. This was not, let me say it again, this was not a new language. And what we have in the Pentecostal movement and I'm not trying to bring anybody down, but this is the primary where this movement of language, this tongue comes from. We have some kind of, some kind of a, a gibberish, some kind of something that can be learned, but it's nothing that's understood. It's not a new language that they're speaking. It's not a language at all. Pentecost was about them speaking in a language that they hadn't been taught, for one, uh, this was a gift, a miracle from God that had been given to them. These guys had not been trained in every language in every nation. It, it was not possible. It was not even possible for this to, to, to take place. It said that there was every nation under heaven was gathered here. There was, there was so many different, and you can look, we could go through and look at the individual ones that was gathered here in verse 9, 10. They was from all over the the area that spoke many different languages. But what the miracle in this was is that when they began to speak and preach and share the glorious things of God is that all of these people heard in their own language. They heard what they were saying in their own language. And this was totally new because we're talking about Hebrews here. They're talking about this Hebrew God. They knew this Hebrew God, but they had never heard the Hebrew God spoken of in their language. This was totally new for them. So they're hearing for the first time about the, the wondrous works of God, and they're hearing about it in their own language. And they're like blown away by this. I mean, they're saying, this is this... 
You know, they cannot, it says in verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, all not, all, are not all these which speak Galileans? They, they, knew, they didn't want none of the same nationality as me. That'd be like me going to another country, and I'm sitting there speaking English, and, and somebody gets up and they speak in Portuguese or some other type of la other language, and they begin to speak, and I begin to understand. Y'all know that don't want to make you man. I would be like, what in the world is going? I'd probably be like this guy's. What in the world is going on here? I mean, I would be marvelled too. I would be amazed too. Oh. Uh, the language uh, that was spoken here uh, that they talked about, I told you this language, of in, uh, it, vanished, it vanished from the early church. And, and it did. It vanished from the early church. While we're here, uh, it had a limited time. God used it for this limited time. He used it for this purpose. Uh, God used it for the intended purpose, purpose He had for it. Uh, in Corinthians, this language, uh, Paul uh, this language of tongues here that we are, are talking about here had been taken in uh, 1 Corinthians and it had been misused and abused and there were so many crazy things going on to the point that was even talking in these languages, actually cursing the name of Jesus. All this was going on in Corinth and Paul had to address it. And that's what we find in the letter uh, 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 in Corinthians. Uh, if you want to turn 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 8, you're going to see a little portion of scripture here. Uh, this la language had been uh, taken uh, to a level of misuse and abuse. And Paul had to address it. Uh, but we also find out uh, sort of uh, that the, the language had its shelf life. And it was coming to a point. So it says in verse 21, and there's a lot of things behind this scripture I'm getting ready to read. Uh, there's some, some Old Testament prophecy and some things. It started out in the law. It was written, that's the Old Testament, with the men of other tongues and other lips. Well, I speak unto these people, and that was a prophecy yet that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And yet, for all that I will, they, they not hear me, saith the Lord. And that's actually speaking of the Jewish people, that even though some heard, some got saved, all in all... At Pentecost, there was one thing took place here. Israel was sort of set to the side. Remember this about Pentecost and in chapter 2. Israel was sort of set to the side at this point. The church was birthed. Doesn't, God wasn't done with Israel. He's not done with Israel. But the church was birthed. That was prophecy being fulfilled at Pentecost. And that's what's in reference in verse 21. They wouldn't hear me. And, and they were set aside here at Pentecost. And the church come forth. God called the church forth to, be, to share the redemptive plan he had for humanity. So all this, see Pentecost, all of this is the pivotal point is Pentecost. All this takes place. Israel sort of puts on the shelf. All these Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled. God said this was going to happen at Pentecost. He, he reiterated it in places in the New Testament. And then he said this in verse 24. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Uh, so what was the purpose? What was the purpose of them speaking in I'm thinking, I'm in the wrong chapter, ain't it? Are y'all in the wrong verse? Oh, I, didn't, I told y'all 13 and 8. I'm actually over on 21, guys. I'm sorry. I'm on verse 21 and 22. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm in chapter 13, or 14. chapter 14, verse 21 and 22. I am so sorry, guys. I got y'all in the wrong place here. So, uh, and I was going to answer this question about the tongues and, and why uh, they was they was used, why it was spoken. And it says in verse 22, Wherefore tongues are, are for a sign, not unto them that believe, but to them that believe not. So the purpose of the tongues was so that these Gentiles that did not believe could hear uh, the message of the wondrous works of God. So that was the purpose of them being shared. Now let me share with you, just in closing, this 1 Corinthians 13, 8 about uh, this prophecy and these tongues. 
So let me turn back over there. 13.8. I'm sorry I got you on the wrong place. So 13.8, we have charity never faileth. Love is something that always, it never fails. You'll have love in heaven. It never fails. It's consistent all the way through. Love will never fade away. So Paul's getting ready to make a comparison here. Charity, which is love, never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. They shall go by the wayside. That's what he's saying. There'll be time when prophecy will be go by the wayside. It says whether they be tongues, they shall cease. See, there's a time when this tongues, God used it for its intended purpose. And this is where I was getting at a while ago. So the purpose was for that time that the, so the unbelieving Gentiles could hear the glorious and wondrous works of the gospel, could hear the wondrous things of God. But then secondly, this, these tongues would pass away. There'd be a time that it was not necessary for tongues to be used. Best, best account we can probably give you is that the first 25 years of the church we, we see this. And then they sort of pass off the scene. You won't find it in the scripture after that. So there was a time, and that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. Love, sure. Charity never fails. Love will always be. We'll, we're going to let heaven, there's going to be love present there. Prophecy, no. And having tongues, no. Those things will have to cease. Uh, God used them for their intended purpose. And then they sort of pass away. That purpose is no longer needed in the redemptive plan God has for humanity. I hope that maybe that helps. I know that in a crazy way I got there somehow. Uh, <laughs> so what was the purpose of the signs? And it told us in verse 11 so they could hear the wondrous, the glorious works of God. So we'll have to cut it short. We'll have to stop right there and we'll finish up that chapter. Uh, I hope that helps. I hope that gets maybe just thinking about these these tongues. I want you to understand them because you're going to be you're going to be confronted by that throughout your Christian walk, whether it's on TV, whether it's by a friend. I, you know, I come I come in. You know, I come out of a, a family that was born. I got preachers in the Church of God. Uh, my mom's brother was a preacher in the Church of God for many years. I've shared with you my history. I, I don't stand here in, a, in any kind of condemning way uh, 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 to say those things, but I just have to tell you, try to share with you what the scriptures uh, teach. You know, I, and I hope all of us can get a better understanding of what the scriptures teach because I grew up hearing these things. I grew up uh, hearing those things, especially, uh, and you hear those in the Pentecostal movement and in the Church of God. Uh, teaching, um, my dad, my dad, you, you can you stop that, now, bro. <laughs> you cut the video off. Uh, my dad, he'll he'll talk about it. He, only way, as a young man, 16, 15 years old, only way he could see my mom is if he went to church. Well, that was the church of God. My mom sung in church. All of her sisters, they played the piano. You know, daddy, all of them, they was solid grounded. My dad, oh, country boy, come in church, sit down back there. He said they was laying hands on him and trying to get him on the altar and throw him on the altar. And they was talking and speaking things he had never heard before. He's scared to death. He didn't go back to church for 20 years. <laughs> he was just like, I don't know what to do. You know, and it, it, just, it was like a, a shock. Literally, he's scared to death. Now, I say that when he was laughing, but truly it was, he was scared. And he, he didn't understand. And I, I want y'all to understand because, you know, you may end up somewhere with a friend sometimes. You never know. You might end up in a service and, and there's some things happening. And I've been there myself many times. And uh, we just want to understand what this tongues is and this language is and what God's purpose is for. You know what I'm saying? So let's pray.